the Laps Factor Podcast. What is up, lacrosse fans? You are watching, I think it's the 104th episode of the Lax Factor podcast. It could be the 105th. I'm losing count here with the the, uh, COVID delirium that's starting to kick in. Uh, We have a bunch of news to talk about today. Duke adding a really solid goaltender in addition to Michael Sowers now. So Duke is really the team winning the transfer battle. Furman uh, disbands their Division I lacrosse program and 30 kids enter the transfer portal. Jared Bernhardt uh, out of Maryland, he is not returning to play. He's got other grand plans. And then UVA loses Michael Krause to the MLL of all places, but they add some stars to boot. So we're going to get into this. But before I do, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, uh, spread the word, share the video, do all that good stuff, but really just smash that like button for us. And as always, you can go to laxfactor.com to get yourself some swag, hats, t-shirts, coffee mugs, uh, you name it, all sorts of non-brand related stuff as well. So go to laxfactor.com. You can watch our videos and see all sorts of other crap that's going on there. So now we get into this. Duke adding St. Joe's goaltender, Mike Adler. He is a very solid goaltender and he's going to have two years of eligibility left. So it's being reported that he's been accepted to grad school Two years left, and he's going to get to rock, probably in cage for Duke. They've had issues on offense. They fixed those issues that they were appearing to have in 2020 on offense by adding Mike Sowers, and they have a wealth of talent behind him now. And they've brought in some other guys on top of it uh, in, in terms of new recruits coming in. It's, it is going to be crazy to see what Duke has uh, offensively uh, this year. So they have issues at goal. And they bring in Adler now. So your two biggest holes offensively, you were lacking an alpha uh, creator, a guy who could just create offense uh, at will. They were lacking that. They bring in Mike Sowers. Now they have the man in terms of creating offense at will. And they were kind of struggling over the last couple of years in cage. They bring in Adler. And I wouldn't call him a guaranteed starter. Uh, He's playing different. He is playing different competition, although St. Joe's schedule is not you know, for chumps by any means, but he's not playing the ACC schedule at least. So that could play a little bit, but this kid has been a solid goaltender for two seasons. Uh, now in, in 2018, fifth highest uh, save percentage in St. Joe's history, 59.6 on a very good St. Joe's squad and uh, his career save percentage while at St. Joe's 56.9% between the pipes. And he was sitting above 59. He was at 59 and change uh, as 2020 played out. As we look at his 2020, Adler started off rough, 42.9% against St. Bonaventure with only six saves. That that tends to happen when you play rough teams, but they only won 15 to eight. Then they play at Penn State and they get beat up, but he puts up a respectable 42.9 against Penn State. So that's weird, 42.9 in his first two outings. Delaware, he goes 69%. Providence and uh, Providence 50%. Monmouth. 80%. So that was pretty damn good. And then we got Drexel 69 and then Penn in a one goal loss to Penn, a very good team. He goes uh, for 19 saves, 59.4%. So this kid can stand, has stood on his head against some pretty good competition. Even against Penn State, he had 12 saves. It's just, you're not going to keep Penn State off the board. So I thought Duke had won the free agency period, as we're going to start calling this now, before they picked Adler up, simply because you pick up Michael Sowers, boom, you win the free agency period in college across. But now they add Adler. They're they're literally just, hey, we have a hole, let's fill it. And uh, that's what she said. And uh, so now Sowers alone alone made him a contender. Adler now possibly gives them a goaltender that can be a little bit more consistent between the pipes. Their midfield uh, talent is is shored up. They have two good lines of midfielders, even though that first midfield line last year struggled mightily to the point where that second midfield line was their – that was their better midfield line. So, I mean, they have two full lines of solid midfielders. Uh, and you know, it's, it's just crazy. I keep saying it. The rich keep getting richer. I still think Maryland has finished second behind Duke in this free agency signing period, but I think Duke has definitely done a better job in terms of just adding the top notch quality. Adler was the best goalie in the portal and Sowers was the best player that, uh, virtually that's ever hit the portal. Uh, bad news coming out of the Division One landscape, and I think we're going to sadly see more of this over time, Furman disbanded their D1 lacrosse program, and we immediately, not immediately, but very shortly after, saw 30 kids 
from Furman enter the transfer portal. As of 6 p.m. May 20th, 30 players from Furman had entered the portal at that point. Freshman attack, Brendan Tenaglia. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that, but he's a solid lacrosse player. I saw him play twice. Uh, 11 goals, 9 assists, 20 points over 7 games, and he started 5 of those 7. So this kid worked himself into the rotation in a serious way. Anders Erickson, sophomore attack, 8-7, 15 points over 7 games. Those are going to be two solid uh, lacrosse players that, that are, uh, someone's going to pick up. Cole Horan, j- junior defender, 11 cost turnovers, 15 GBs, so he's going to help somebody out. And then a kid that I don't think his uh, statistics uh, equal his quality, uh, Vanden Bovenkamp is a very solid goaltender. So I think he entered the portal actually before this was all announced because I think I remember saying like, ah, Vanden Bovenkamp, like his stats aren't that great, but he's, you know, when I've seen him play, he's performed well. He had really good form, uh, looked like a solid goaltender that just needed a little bit more help in front of him because I think what were Furman was what one in 12 in 2019. I don't think Furman was very good in 2019 and I don't think they were looking all that great in 2020. Uh, but that's terrible news, terrible news for Furman, terrible news for those kids, for those families, for the recruits that had decided to go there. And, uh, sadly, I do not think this is going to be the last team that we see fold. I think we're going to see this happen, uh, may possibly a handful of times. Uh, we may see if a bunch of teams decide to fold it definitely at the D three level and the D two level, I think we'll see it happen. But even at the D one already, we can see that, uh, schools, no one is immune to this. Uh, Maryland news. So Maryland gets their their first batch of bad news in that Jared Bernhardt Sr. would not be returning. Uh, the, the wearer of the storied number one, he would, would not be returning for his super senior year and instead kept his promise that he was going to go play a graduate year of football. He has chosen Division II powerhouse Ferris State uh, to play his college football. So Bad news for Maryland. They lose. Some people would say he was their best player. I would say he was their best player. Some people may try to make an argument for Wisnowskis, but I think that he was all around their best player, their overall best creator of offense. And an ex- and, and for a guy who created and dodged as well as he did, he was also a very solid off-ball player. He could contribute all over the field, and he didn't have to, to get mega touches in order to do so. He was one of those guys like uh, – uh, Jackson Morrill that could let the game come to him within the system and still get his points because he was an efficient, he's efficient um, uh, along all lines. 51 goals, 27 helpers, 78 points in 2019, a very solid season. I believe he was a Twarton finalist. He was a Twarton candidate all year, but I think he was one of the five Twarton finalists, deserving, deservingly so. 191 career points, 29 points in six games across 2020 as that season started to go down. This is a huge loss for Maryland. However, don't cry for the Terps because they come in second in my free agency period rankings because they picked up the Colgate attackman. They picked up Holden from uh, Hobart. Uh, They picked up a defender from somewhere. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on all the guys that Maryland has picked up, but Maryland, Maryland didn't go out and add any any big names, Maryland went out and added legitimate starters. They added guys with experience, with legitimate skills. Uh, offensively, the two guys they picked up uh, from Colgate and, and Hobart are as good as anyone they have offensively outside of you know their top guy in Wisnowskis. These guys have the potential of stepping on the field and playing for them and making them a better team. So you put those, uh, Holden, uh, what was the Colgate kid's name? It's going to drive me nuts that I can't remember that off the top of my head. Um, but either way, those two guys will help ease the pain a little bit from losing uh, losing Bernhardt. And then the other question becomes, who's going to take over the number one? I would presume we're going to see Logan Wisnowskis take his jersey that he was wearing off. What was he, number 12? And I'd presume that we're going to see him drop the two off the end, and he's going to wear the number one. It may have already been announced, but I'm just predicting Wisnowska seems like the obvious bet. Uh, Maryland's been giving it to the most proven returning player, and I'd say Wisnowska is definitely the most proven returning player. Uh, he, a very solid goal scorer, good dodger, great spot shooter, big, huge body, big, huge target. So I'm a big I'm a big Wisnowskis fan. 
in the end, even though I'm not supposed to like the Terps as a as a diehard Cuse guy. Now we have other college news, but college news that pivots into some strange, unexpected pro news, and that is UVA. Michael Krause has officially decided not to return. Uh, UVA did add some stars though, so they lose Krause just like Maryland loses Bernhardt, but uh, they lose Krause to the MLL. We'll talk about that after because Kraus got taken in both drafts and he chose the MLL. Uh, but they pick up Charlie Bertrand, a Merrimack transfer, very solid attack. He'll add some depth. He put up 20 points or so last year in Merrimack's first season. That was Merrimack's, what, first season at D1? He trashed on the Division II uh, landscape before Merrimack moved up. Uh, they also have Peyton Cromier. Uh, I, I never know how to pronounce these guys' names, even though I hear it. I forget when I get here and I'm on the spot. Uh, they got him back, though. What was he, number 24 last year? He got a lot of burn last year, so he could fill that third attack spot. Bertrand trend could potentially fill that attack spot, but I'm not worried. UVA has somebody that'll fill that third attack spot and they will do well. But Bertrand, he definitely helps. They're also getting Connors back. I think I saw. So that helps as well. You can't replace Kraus, but, and neither of these guys that they picked up are going to replace Kraus, but you, you still have more a year older, Laviano a year older, and then a bunch of other guys that are going to fill in. So losing Kraus is tough, but the, the kicker with Kraus, and this is the weird thing. I, Myself had said that the PLL was the clear winner. Who would ever get drafted by the PLL and then not play in the PLL? And we're already starting to see parity. One of the things we saw early was almost everyone had projected Nick Mellon was going to go fairly high, or at least as one of the top 14 guys taken in the PLL draft. And when he wasn't taken in the PLL draft, everybody was like, what the hell? He had already been taken in the MLL draft at that point. But everyone just assumed these guys that get taken in the PLL, they're going to jump ship and they're going to hit the PLL up. So Mellon doesn't get taken in the PLL draft. Now, in hindsight, Mellon has signed with the team that took him in the MLL draft. And was that because he did he inform PLL teams that he was going to sign with the MLL team? Did they uh, did they expect that was the case, even if it wasn't official? Because everybody thought it was really weird that they took Mellon. Uh, in the MLL and that nobody took him in the PLL. And then we see him sign with the MLL team that signed him. So good luck to Mellon. That's awesome. But then we see Kraus get taken in both drafts. And once again, I just assumed why wouldn't Michael Kraus play in the PLL? He decided to sign on with the, what is it? The Connecticut Hammerheads. So he gets to play with uh, Brad Voigt up there or over there in Connecticut. But we're seeing guys pick the MLL over the PLL. Now, I'm not sure how much more crossover there was and where those guys went. I believe we uh, saw The Undertaker out of Yale. He just took, I think he just signed with the MLL, but uh, I'll do a special episode. I think that's going to be our next podcast is we'll, we'll go through the roster of guys that the MLL picked up. And, you know, the PLL here, they only drafted 14 guys in all. And obviously they didn't even sign them all. Um, the PLL, they drafted a boatload of guys. Obviously, they didn't sign them all. But when you go through the list of guys that the PLL has signed, actually, why not? Why not go through that list? I have it right here. So let's just click on this. But the Mellon one was a really odd thing for most because we were all sitting here thinking that Mellon was, I would think I'd pick Mellon as possibly going third. It looked like there was a world in which it wouldn't have been a bad idea for the PLL, the, whoever had the third pick to take Mellon. And then the guy doesn't get picked up at all. So guys that the MLL has signed, and this is, I think this is a really big deal here. We've got Sam Lucchesi out of Hobart. He was a solid goalkeeper playing for a, you know, mid-level team. Uh, but the big goalie here, I think probably one of the best goalies overall in the draft was Nick Washuda. So he just signed with the Denver Outlaws. So there's two solid goaltenders at the top of this list here, uh, Lucchesi and um, uh, Washuda out of Delaware. And then we got Michael Brown out of Brown, LSM out of Brown, just got picked up and signed by who? The Connecticut Hammerheads. We've got... Tom Wright. I'm not sure who Tom Wright is. Uh, I don't know if that's bad. I don't know how many people are going to be mad that I'm not familiar with Tom Wright out of Penn State that just signed with the Lizards. Maybe this is going to backfire on me because a lot of these names aren't all that huge. Um, we've got Kevin Hill out of Penn State. He was a solid player. We have Will Renz out of Yale. Very solid midfielder. Uh, another another solid pickup here. We've got, yeah, all right. So I'm going to take it back. There isn't like a whole lot of star power 
uh, here outside of Kraus and then those two goalies I mentioned and Mellon um, also, but they're still a lot of solid players. And, and for two huge guys, because Mellon and Kraus were probably easily, they were both top 10 caliber picks for either of the leagues, but I posit that those were both top five guys. And for two of the top five guys to decide that it was a better fit for them to play in the MLL, that puts a little bit of question uh, into who's really winning this battle overall. I feel like a merger eventually has to happen. Uh, one professional lacrosse league hasn't been able to make it work for uh, outdoor league, I should say specifically, hasn't been able to make it work consistently and effectively for 10, 15, 20 years now, however long the MLL has been a thing. It's been a long time. So if one league couldn't make it, put it all together and make it work, why would two be better? Uh, it's, it's simply going to split the focus, I think. I think that's what's going to end up hurting them is neither is going to get uh, all of the attention and then you're going to end up having some people that split attention, split allegiances and things like that. So I think that hurts. Definitely having the MLL still floating around hurts the PLL's attendance because if you have an MLL team in your region and you can just go to those games, that's a lot easier than hitting the road and going to wherever you have to go to see that one PLL contest. So that still, I think, is the... The thing that the MLL has on the PLL is the regionality and the loyalties that that will bring. And I think that's still a huge mistake. Uh, it's not going to be as much of a, a mistake now uh, in this second season with the COVID. And I think that the PLL is going to have a huge advantage, assuming they're the ones that get off first, get the season off first, and that this whole two-week tournament thing works out. But, um, it hey, picking up some big names, uh, the MLL picking up some big names, that's going to be huge. Like Kraus, for instance, I forget who the guy, the three on that line is, but it's going to be Kraus and Voigt. They're going to play very well together with Voigt, the off-ball guy, Kraus, the kind of quarterback of the offense. He's a real, Kraus is a true 50-50 guy, one of the toughest Dodgers in the sport of lacrosse at all levels. This kid can go to the rack. He goes to the rack hard. He's a, a deceptively strong is what I would call him. Because he's not this big, physically imposing guy, but he plays like an absolute animal. So huge pickup for the MLL. That's an incredible news for the MLL, right down to the point that now I, I've always had a problem with pro lacrosse because I've always been a Syracuse lacrosse fan. And then, yeah, I'd, I'd like to watch the Syracuse guys do well at the next level, but it was hard with them split all over the place. And then you don't end up being able to, it's hard to pick a team. I was a, I tried to be a Rochester Rattlers fan, but as I've talked about before, my issue with the MLL always became not being able to get the games on TV. I'm a busy fellow. Don't have a lot of time to travel. Uh, don't even even though Rochester's just it's still two and a half plus hours away from me. So it's it's difficult, and it was always difficult to get to games. So when they were on, I'd watch them. The, the, it was just they never had a good enough TV deal where it was easy to find these games. And with the PLL, I've I watched more PLL by choice than I've watched MLL all time just last year alone because of how easy it was to watch the games and over the summer barbecuing on the back porch on a weekend boom I'm watching lacrosse all weekend every game so the MLL needed a better TV deal they need a better TV deal to make it work but uh, because that's what's going to eventually kill them it'll be the slow burn of no eyeballs it's going to kill them in the long run so it's but still now I'm starting to see these college this is my point in all this. I'm gonna start seeing these college kids that I've been following the last two years doing this podcast and I've become fans of these guys. Now it gives me a whole different reason for wanting to tune in and watch them play at the next level, especially guys, the big names, like the guys like Krauss, the guys like Voigt, um, the guys like Mellon, uh, these guys that are going and in and, and the Penn State, um, what's his name? Uh, Amat, you know, playing in the PLL. I'm 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 wanting to tune in now just to see how these new guys do. And, uh, and that's going to, I think, draw me in and, and rope me in completely and sell me completely on the pro game. So then you guys all get to hear me talk about pro lacrosse a hell of a lot more. So I don't even know how long I've been rambling. I'm assuming it, I've got to be close to my cutoff here, and it's about uh, it's about time to get my, my ass to work here. So I'm going to cut this off now. The next episode... We're going to do a pro show where we're going to go through and we're going to start talking about the you know what it's going to look like uh, for the MLL, what the MLL rosters look like, what the PLL rosters look like as they're all starting to finalize and make some moves. So we'll talk about some of the roster moves that the teams are making over the course of the next couple of days. And I I, I didn't this week. I got once again I got sick. I tr was going to put two episodes out and we're going to try to start putting out two shows, two full thirty minute shows a week. But uh, this week did not happen because I got sick. I had a sore throat of all things. So I haven't left the house. I don't know where I picked 
pick that up. I'm hoping I don't have the COVID and it's uh, the Rona and it's uh, just allergies. So that's it for today's episode. As always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you're notified when we put out videos. Uh, you can go to laxfactor.com, get yourself some swag, hats, t-shirts, mugs, whatever the hell you want. Uh, we have branded stuff as well as um, the more complex um, uh, just random lacrosse t-shirts and things like that. We also are selling a lot of these reversibles. Any reversible I had that didn't have my name on it that I haven't worn, uh, we have those up on our Sideline Swap store, sidelineswap.com forward slash Lax Factor. I think that's the link to it. And um, and then, but you can go to laxfactor.com and we have reversibles and t-shirts and things like that up there that you can purchase as well. I see uh, Micah Bush uh, you bought yourself a reversible, so we'll get that bad boy shipped out. I think that goes out today, uh, but I'll ping you on social media. Long time fan, uh, Mr. Bush has been of the show, and I saw he bought a he bought what the what'd you buy, Micah the the uh, Vipers the Vipers reversible, I think. So that'll that'll head out to you. So that's it. As always, thank you for listening. I will be back with another show early next week. I'll probably get bored and do some stuff this weekend as well. Finally, now that I'm feeling better, and uh, that is it. Hoost is out. Thank <laughs> you.